Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Your Excellency, Mr. President, graduating class, and distinguished guests. Today we're holding the first convocation of the Lahore University of Management Sciences at our own campus. And we have gathered here to honor the achievements of the MBA class of 1993. At the outset, LUMS had set for itself a high standard of performance in pursuit of its objective of being a center of excellence for management education. In our march towards realization of our goals, we initially utilized temporary accommodation and vigorously pursued the software side of the university, namely development of our human resources, our curriculum, systems, and traditions. At the same time, we bought this piece of land and sought funds for building our campus. The internal challenges were totally within our control, but those relating to funds permission for construction, and access to the campus were not. One by one, these hurdles were removed. We are grateful to the Army authorities, the government of USA, Canada, UK, and our many friends for their assistance. Through their help, where there were open fields, there is now brick and mortar. Where there was barren land, there is now cross-fertilization of ideas, knowledge, and skills. Arriving at our new home marks the end of the first phase of our development and the beginning of the second. We look to this second phase with hope and aspirations that it will eventually lead to greater fulfillment and growth. Mr. Chancellor, this is an appropriate time for reflection and to rededicate ourselves to our mission and goals. We now have the facilities for expansion and are in a position to enable LUMS to play a greater role in the socio-economic development of our country. At LUMS, planning is a collaborative team effort. The governors, trustees, the dean and faculty are continuously thinking of how to maintain excellence of their current programs and develop new ones. In this endeavor, we are grateful to our International Advisory Committee for their advice and guidance. We are honored by the presence today of the Dean and the professors from Harvard, Stanford, and McGill. However, LUM seeks to attain a harmonious blend of their experience and global knowledge with our local needs and cultural and religious values. This blend is important, for no university can be great if it merely reflects the image of another. As LUMS grows, it will, inshallah, radiate its own unique intellectual and academic aspirations to primarily serve the nation's needs. Achievement of this goal will continue to be a major challenge in the coming years. The other task ahead of us is to bring greater depths into our MBA program while expanding the student body. We also aim to increase the diversity and quantum of programs offered in the new Executive Development Center, which will be completed early next year. We will now also be able to realize the full potential of our small business center and the Center for Management and Research. A good beginning has been made, but we have a long way to go before it can make its contribution the way we envisage it. Currently, perhaps, the single biggest task ahead of us will be the introduction of our BSc Honours Program in September next year. This program will begin to widen the impact of the university, as now we will affect many more families 
and bring individuals into our ambit at a much younger age. Our new BSc Honours Program will be for three years, providing gross based education to our youth. Initially, specialization will be offered in economics and computer science. The program will include courses in liberal arts. In addition, we will include courses highlighting our heritage and religion. In our bachelor's program, we aim to develop the same work ethics and thinking ability currently prevalent in our MBA program. This is absolutely imperative, and this is what is sadly missing in many of our other institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, through these expansions, at the next convocation, we will, inshallah, be double our current size in terms of students. The year after, we may be double once again. And as the university spreads its wings, it will be still larger five years from now. However, we're not seeking growth per se. It is just the natural outcome of public demand and our past efforts and achievements. We assure you, ladies and gentlemen, we will never compromise on quality. In many fields of national endeavor, we have sought quantity instead of quality, and how dearly we have paid for it. Hence, we will have planned growth rather than unbridled growth. The challenge before us is to grow and yet maintain our standards and our dedication to our mission. By the time our first batch of undergraduates stand in this August gathering, the next century will be staring at us. The dawn of this new century will bring in its wake the next round of challenges, and I guess they will keep coming in an endless stream. We know that the best institutions have to continuously improve themselves and respond to new ideas and pressures placed on them by society. Ladies and gentlemen, deep in our hearts we all know there are no shortcuts to greatness. It can only be attained through sustained hard work over years and decades. If we can achieve this, we will have realized our vision. In these turbulent times when the bastions of quality and excellence around the world be they business corporations or social institutions, are struggling for their existence. It brings home the fallibility of human beings and how easy it is to slip into decadence. It is in this light that one prays to Almighty Allah to give us the wisdom and courage to face the daunting tasks ahead of us. With all humility, we seek His assistance, for without it, we cannot succeed. With it, we cannot fail. I would like to congratulate the graduating class of 1993. As you step out into the world, remember that your actions and deeds will contribute the, to the greatness of your alma mater and your nation. Retain high aspirations in your hearts, but be patient and humble in achieving them. I wish to thank the faculty, staff, and students for their loyalty, hard work, and support in the ongoing achievement of our objectives. Also to our valuable contributors for their continued confidence in our ability to pursue our mission. To all, we pledge our commitment to quality and performance and to the attainment of our ultimate goal of becoming a premier institution of learning in this region. On a personal note, it's been wonderful working with all associated with LUMS. Whenever I come here, it's nice to meet the faculty and also to get to know the students. However, one never meets the parents. And so my special congratulations to parents of the graduating class. I'm sure you're relieved that you no longer have to stay up through the night while your children are completing their assignments at LUMS. 
Finally, to all of us at LUMS, let's keep the same spirit as the LUMS family grows. I would like to thank all our distinguished guests for honoring us by their presence today and thank the donors for their contribution, the largest this year being by Mr. Tariq Seed Saigo, rupees 10 million. I would also like to thank you, Mr. President, for gracing this occasion. I will now request Sayyid Barbara Lee, the Pro Chancellor, to address the gathering. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Mr. President, distinguished friends, Today is a first for all of us, Mr. President. It's your first visit to the university as its chancellor. On behalf, therefore, of the Board of Governors, the faculty, and the students, I should like to welcome you formally and to thank you for making such a significant occasion. For us here at the university, it is also a first it is the first official ceremony we are holding on the new campus, that this function should be the annual convocation in our new home adds a deeper solemnity to the event. I know, Mr. President, that you will, be, you will wish me to extend our thanks to all those who have supported the university since its inception and who have made this special day possible. In particular, I have in, I have in mind our architect, who I'm very happy to see sitting there, Mr. Habib Fedali, for having created this outstanding design, which symbolizes not only the first, the spirit of the university, but harmonizes with the architectural traditions of Lahore. Donors, in particular USAID, have subscribed generously towards the cost of the facilities you see around you. Their contribution is being given recognition on the buildings themselves. In this manner, they will become a permanent and enduring part of the university they have helped build. A university, though, is more than simply a complex of bricks built brick buildings or an open campus. It is more than a dream. It is a vision. A vision shared by people who have faith in the cause of education. People who understand the value of good education. For to teach is to construct the future for our nation. And there can be no nobler goal than that for any Pakistani. Here at LUMS, we are fortunate in having a faculty motivated by such ideals and qualified to fulfill them. Under their supervision, over the years, 243 MBAs have graduated and found places in businesses, corporations, and organizations. Their ready acceptability is a measure of the standing LUMS enjoys in the business community it is designed to serve. No country can have enough managers, and Pakistan needs more than most. To make more managers, we need to expand our facilities. To make better managers, we need to improve ourselves. At LUMS, that is an ongoing process. Our master's program will be expanded to include specialization in areas such as information systems, production management, and other management disciplines. By the time of the next convocation, inshallah, we shall have also started our BSc Honors program. That will provide our children with another option to obtain a sound university education of a standard comparable with international levels. It will not be a cheap education, but as you will agree, Mr. President, 
if education is expensive, good education costs even more. But the most costly of all is ignorance, and no nation can afford the luxury of ignorance. Pakistan, as you know, allocates deplorably low amounts to education. We spend less on education than most developed countries spend on chocolates. If we are to improve as we can and should, we need to reappraise our priorities. We need to make education up to secondary level a shared responsibility between the student and society. Today it is free up to university level. By not paying for education, the student undervalues it. A place in a university should be as much a reward as a right. It should be a recognition of aptitude, hard work, and performance. The deserving student should receive support through loan schemes sponsored by the government and the private sector. These loans can be repaid out of future income following graduation. That, that would teach our youth a valuable lesson. Except for sunshine and fresh air, nothing is free on this earth. And even fresh air is becoming scarce, almost as scarce as a good education. At LUMS, we have tried such a scheme. Over the past seven years, no one with merit has been denied admission. Thanks to the scholarship fund, supported by banks and private donations, rupees 20 million have been given. Our recovery rate has been 95%. That is a good omen for the future. The names of LAMS graduates are unlikely to appear on any future list of bank defaulters. For LAMS graduates are taught to repair their debts, their financial debts, in, and in time, their debts to society. The convocation today, Mr. President, which you have dignified with your presence, is for the graduating class of 93. On behalf of the university, of which you are the chancellor, I would like to extend to each of these students our congratulations on their graduation. They have worked hard, they have succeeded, and they deserve our warmest applause. You, the class of 93, will have individual goals to achieve. LUMS has tried to inculcate in you three values which make up a good human being. Honesty, integrity, and humility. Having all these three never hurt anyone. Not having any of the, them hurts society and therefore your country. Remember your university, for your university will always remember you with pride, affection, and a continuing interest in your future. These three virtues, honesty, integrity, and humility, I associate with our guest speaker, Mr. Shaukat Aziz. Through his ability and hard work, he has achieved a prominence in international banking unrivaled by anyone from his generation. He is a role model for all Pakistanis. I am honored by his friendship and doubly so by his ready acceptance to travel to Lahore and to address this, our fifth convocation today, Mr. Shaukat Aziz. Your Excellency, Mr. President, members of the Board of Governors, members of the faculty, honored graduates and their parents, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I feel very privileged to address you on this important occasion in the lives of these young men and women 
who are about to launch themselves upon the world as well as prepared, trained, as it is in our power to make them and it is in theirs to make themselves. To the graduates, I wish to convey my sincere congratulations on the accomplishment your presence at this ceremony signifies and offer my best wishes for your future success, of which I have little doubt. It may take a little longer than you think and be a bit harder than you expected, but of its inevit inevitable certainty, I am convinced beyond doubt. You come upon a world that I truly believe for one of those rare times in its history offers more promise than peril. And you have been armed to make your mark on it, a mark that can respond to the honor and accomplishment of your country and benefit of your countrymen, both present and those who will follow you. Let me share with you, graduating students and guests, a brief overview of the global economic situation, followed by some models of success and how I believe Pakistan can benefit from these experiences. I will then conclude by talking about certain personal values, which I think would be meaningful, meaningful for all of you graduating today. In the world today, the Cold War has largely come to an end. Communism has virtually disappeared and the world is moving to market-driven economies. The economies of the OECD, or largely developed countries, are slowing slow growth, with the USA and the United Kingdom showing some growth, while continental Europe and Japan experiencing severe dislocation in their economies. This is because of declining exports, high labor and social costs, protectionism, lower investment in research and development, exchange rate appreciation, and a host of other reasons. On the other hand, non-OECD countries, particularly in Asia and Latin America, are growing rapidly with GDP growth rates of 6 to 8 percent. In a survey of Asia, appearing in a recent issue of The Economist magazine, the writer characterized Asia's modernization as likely to be the most momentous public event of modern times. This unprecedented growth, ladies and gentlemen, and the improvement in the standard of living in Asia is due to sound economic policies, including unleashing of the private sector as an engine of growth, privatization of public sector enterprises, free flow of capital and trade, high domestic savings, as well as encouragement to local and foreign investment. These countries have shown consistency of policy, political stability, and have a clear vision of economic policy, which is developed by the leadership and shared, accepted, and understood by all segments of society. There is a sense of purpose and direction coupled with good governance, transparency, and accountability. Private and foreign investment and not debt alone are needed to enable growth in an economy. But to attract capital, a country must, first, have a desirable risk return profile, and second, work very hard to communicate this profile to the community at large. Pakistan will have to compete for that capital, not just with investment alternatives in the developed world, but with the rest of the developing world, including Eastern and Central Europe, Latin America, and the rest of Asia, including its highly successful, fast-growing, and capital-hungry neighbors in East Asia. Just like companies, countries must compete with each other to sell their investment appeal, as well as their products. This has many implications for the governments that intend to compete successfully. I can cite three areas of concern worth careful consideration. The requirement to develop and demonstrate commitment and expertise on the government's part. The need to put in place a modern financial sector that functions in ways and at levels the global investment community desires. And the ability to communicate effectively what a country is going to move the process of reform along, while at the same time maintaining economic stability. Outside of Japan, Singapore has one of the highest per capita GDP rates in Asia. I recently heard the father of Singapore's free market economy 
Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew, who has been a regular visitor to Pakistan, talk about the reasons behind his country's enormous success. He cited seven guidelines that he used in guiding Singapore's development. They are instructive and very relevant to most developing countries, including, I believe, Pakistan. Let me share these with you. Number one is clean government. Government should be shaped into an effective instrument of policy. This requires strong, fair, and just leaders who would have the moral strength to command the respect of the people and unify people from all walks of life. Number two, national solidarity. Countries must maintain national unity, social cohesiveness, and people must rise above racial, tribal, or provincial considerations. Without a united people, development is almost impossible. Third, family planning. Population growth should be controlled and adequate, adequate investment should be made in the health sector. Number four, pragmatism over dogma. There is a need for consistent economic policies, not allowing political expediencies to override economic realities. Fifth, attract investment. Provide a framework of policies which would attract foreign investment, as local savings and investments will not be adequate to sustain the required speed of growth. Number six, education. Improve literacy and make quality education available to all. Number seven, go for results. Pursue national interests regardless of theories or ideologies. Ladies and gentlemen, these are relevant to Singapore, but I think we can all learn a lot from them. Pakistan in the past has been held back by a lack of consistent economic policies. This is now changing. In recent years, we have seen clear and positive steps. We have made substantial progress, but I think we can do much better. Ladies and gentlemen, you are all aware of the economic challenges facing the country and what solutions are needed to give us sustained growth. These are not dissimilar to what other Asian countries have followed. We need fiscal discipline, increased domestic and foreign investment, tax reform, deregulation, privatization, and allowing the private sector to unleash, unleash its full potential. We do not have time today to go through a detailed discussion of what we need to do, but looking at examples I have cited, it should be clear that we need to adapt these to our circumstances. Economic health, however, is about more policies and institutions and investment capital. It is about another type of capital called human capital by some economists. It is about people. Pakistan is a country with tremendous promise, rich not just in assets but in manpower. Our people are industrious with, pe with proven entrepreneurial skills. More must be done to help them realize their potential. As critically important as it is to educate our future leaders as you know, at universities like this one, the most successful countries of Asia are also putting tremendous resources into primary and secondary education. We must do likewise. The literacy rate in most successful developing countries are among the highest in the world. Pakistan's literacy rate has improved, but it's still a bit low, around 30%. We must do better for our people. Education improves the productivity of the workforce as surely as engineering and equipment. A more productive workforce not only produces more, it consumes more because it earns more. We must do better for our people so that our people can do better for themselves. Let me share with you a quote from G.K. Chesterton, the British writer who said, education is simply the soul of society as it passes from one generation to another. Dear graduates, I hope you leave here today uh, and see the challenge before you, not just as a personal accomplishment, but one of personal contribution. I hope you will look around and look inside yourself and see how you can make your impact felt in the development of our country to help it re realize its full potential in a world that offers much promise but becomes more competitive by the day. Before I conclude, I would like to share with you, the graduating class, some personal values which I have found useful in performing my personal and professional duties. These are not startling revelations, but will prob probably revalidate what you believe in. Number one is practice simplicity. Keep things simple, do not overanalyze or complicate issues. Exercise good common sense and judgment. Number two, have a bias for action. 
80% of the facts are usually good enough to take a decision. Boone Pickens said, be willing to make decisions. That's the most important quality in a good leader. Don't fall victim to what I call the ready aim, aim, aim syndrome. You must be willing to fire. Number three, be sensitive to need for information. Be inquisitive, probe and have a 360 degree antenna so you know what's happening around you locally, regionally and globally. See how these interrelate to each other and how they impact your own situation. Number four, foster an, an entrepreneurial spirit. Don't be afraid of taking measured risks. A few mistakes will make you a better person in the long run. Number five, set, set high standards. Strive for excellence in everything you do and shun mediocrity. Number six, treat people fairly. People you work with should be treated with respect and concern for their welfare. Encourage teamwork and strive to achieve individual and collective goals. Be willing to learn and share knowledge. Number seven, be willing to change. Experiment and tinker with reason. Do not always accept the status quo as gospel. Number eight, be driven by professionalism. We all face a multitude of pressures in life and it gets harder, not easier as you progress ahead. Objective decision making is of critical importance. Be willing to say no when necessary. Do not compromise integrity. This would include, number one, individual responsibility. Do what you are supposed to diligently and do it to the best of your ability. Number two, interdependence. Help each other to achieve collective success. Practice teamwork. Number three, intellectual honesty. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Number four, incorruptibility. Do not compromise your principles because of material benefits or conflict of interest. I have shared these values with you as I believe that practicing them along in, uh, will, with hard work, dedication and commitment will help lead you on the way to a successful career. There are no shortcuts to success and the road to the top is long and hard. Balance is a key virtue which we need to exercise between careers and our responsibilities to our families, country and the world at large. Material and personal benefits cannot and should not be our sole objectives in life. You are creatures of the community. You have roots where you are and your fate is tied to the whole bloom. Collective and national success must have a place of importance in your life. As members of society, we must all do our bit to contribute at home, in our jobs, to society and to our country. It is the way we repay our forebearers for all they have done for us. It is our legacy to our children. The excellent voluntary work done by Sayyid Babar Ali and his colleagues and the Board of Governors at LUMS is a pristine example to all of us of how leadership, determination, commitment and drive a major world-class institution can be built to serve society by providing knowledge and education to our future generations. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you, and I hope that many more such institutions, such centers of excellence in different academic fields, will be set up throughout the country on a voluntary basis and with the help of the private sector. Your Excellency, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate your patience in listening to me today. I feel very honored that I was asked to share this afternoon with such an august group of people. Pakistan it has a, is at a very important crossroads, and I hope and pray that we will put our collective energies together to make the country a successful economic power, one which is admired, respected, and looked up to by the world at large, one that meets the aspirations and needs of our people and gives our next generation a foundation upon which to build on. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم Speaker, Punjab Assembly Mr. Pro-Chancellor 
members of the graduating class, ladies and gentlemen. Sayyid Babar Ali spoke of the firsts this convocation represents. I may add that this is my first formal speaking engagement as president. To give you some idea of the importance I attach to quality education designed to meet critical needs of our society. Indeed, the new government accords high priority to education generally and seeks resources and strategies to make it possible for our human mass to be converted into an optimal resource. I am indeed very happy to be at LAMS today. I am happy because this institution symbolizes our quest for quality education in an environment of generally declining standards. I am happy because this venture is a convincing manifestation of the business sector's commitment to higher education in an atmosphere of commonly perceived apathy towards social causes. And I am happy because the nurturing of institutions like this reinforces our confidence that given the right type of direction and commitment, we could be world class. As the university moves into its beautiful new campus, I hope it will be able to expand its existing courses and offer advanced programs in management that some call the central resource of the developed countries and the basic need of the developing ones. Whether it be management or any other priority area, our failure over the years to produce properly trained cadres to cater for our felt needs appears to be one of the major factors responsible for the sorry situation we find ourselves in. No doubt we have made some progress, but a frank and honest assessment would show how large is the gap between our potential and achievements. Years of neglect of real problems, crowned by gross mismanagement, rampant corruption, and the plunder of national assets has created an untenable economic situation. We are faced with acute resources shortages and are crippled by huge deficits. Financial indiscipline is widespread and waste has become a national habit. Our priorities have been distorted and development efforts misguided. Our scarce resources have been spent on grandiose projects of low national priority and to the utter neglect of the social sector. Economic development in Pakistan has been rather haphazard. The benefits of growth have not equitably permeated down to the masses, nor have they been so distributed by region to satisfy the demands of the Federation. We are thus faced with a distressing situation and cannot continue further with economic mismanagement, whether at the mac macro or micro level. The situation in the social sector is particularly disquieting. Our population is growing, indeed exploding at an alarming rate. Health care is not available to most of our people. Many do not have proper roofs over their heads. Even safe drinking water is not available to a very large number. Millions of our children have no school to go to. All other social indicators present an equally dismal picture. Unless we act with a sense of urgency and in right earnest, our dream of building a better future for the generations to come will surely be frustrated. This candid evaluation of where we stand should not cause us to despair. Rather, it should serve as a warning for us to redouble the efforts to realize our full potential as a nation. We are much better placed than many. Ours 
is a vast country. We have fertile lands and are endowed with rich natural resources. Our people are intrinsically honest and enterprising. We have a huge, diligent, and dedicated workforce and a motivated entrepreneurial class. We thus have a good base to build on, and inshallah, build we shall. But we need to have more confidence in ourselves, set our direction right, plan imaginatively, and work devotedly. The time was never more opportune. Following the recent elections, an environment of political stability has been created in the country. This should make it possible for us to shirk ad hocism and adopt sound, consistent, stable policies. Priorities have to be reordered to meet with the needs of our society and ranking very high among them is human resource development through education. That our literacy rate is abysmally low needs no reiteration. That we allocate shamefully meager resources to this vital sector is also common knowledge. It is also no secret that whatever education we offer to our children leaves much to be desired, both in content and quality. Even university level education has hardly any relevance to our national needs and lacks in applicability to the actual problems of our society. All this must change if we are to transform our people into a really optimal resource for development and to improve their quality of life. We must, on the one hand, make rapid strides towards universalizing literacy, and on the other, set up institutions of higher learning to produce people who are not only equipped with the relevant knowledge, but are, but are also well-groomed, trained, and willing to apply that knowledge for practical problem-solving problem in our own objective conditions, according to our own socio-cultural norms, and with regard to our own national priorities. We need to reorient our higher education system to be a catalyst of development rather than an intellectual luxury for the rich to indulge in. To this end, the country's wealthy bear a special responsibility. They must repair their debt to the society to which they owe their riches, their respect, and identity. The nation expects more and more of our business people to follow the example of the founders of LUMS. Apart from management sciences, there are a number of disciplines in which Pakistan needs to have dedicated institutions of quality. Computer sciences, electronics, metallurgy, nuclear sciences, biotechnology, and chemical and genetic engineering are the few that come to mind. If we are to claim our rightful place in the Committee of Nations, we have got to establish facilities of higher learning in the country. We must be able to leapfrog in knowledge. Our students can and do go abroad in pursuit of knowledge, but at what cost? If spirited and resourceful people can come forward and set up such centers of higher learning within the country, a much larger number of our students can benefit from them at a much lower cost to the nation. That is how nations are built, and that is what we expect of our Fords and Rockefellers. Of course, the public sector will have to bear the major burden, but I wish to emphasize the role of the private sector because that will be the prime engine of growth in the future. Since the new government espouses the cause of private-public participation, what greater felt need or nobler end could there be for its practical manifestation than education? This would open up new vistas for our country's rich 
and at the same time provide in its wake greater opportunity as also responsibility for professional managers. They would now be expected to be guided not by considerations of profit maximization alone, but also by national priorities and social responsibilities. I would like to congratulate the graduating class who can rightly be proud of having received quality education within Pakistan. I am sure modern management concepts and practices taught to you at this university have prepared you sufficiently to shoulder your new responsibilities and trained you to synthesize the interests of your companies with the public good for the benefit of all. You will thus become role models of competence, excellence, commitment, integrity, and above all, sacrifice, because you appreciate the gravity of the situation and its compulsions better. The nation expects you to play a critical role in transforming Pakistan into a vibrant, prosperous, and proud country. May God be with you, Pakistan Pahindabad.